Good evening. Welcome to St. Paul's for our service of Holy Communion this Maundy Thursday, where we remember Jesus' last night before he was crucified. I want to extend a specially warm welcome to you if you are new or visiting with us. I know there are some people here visiting from other churches tonight. Welcome. You are, we're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Or if you're joining online, we're just delighted that you are here as we come together and remember this sacred night. Uh, as we stand and before we begin, I invite you to turn and extend that welcome to someone around you. Greet someone you know or don't know. Make them feel at home here at St. Paul's. And then as you remain standing, join in our opening hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. Please do be seated. Well, welcome again to St. Paul's. A special welcome to visitors or if you're joining us online. We're so glad that you're here. For this Maundy Thursday service, we, may be, we realize it may be unfamiliar to some people. You're invited to follow along however you feel comfortable. Everything you need for the service will be on the screen. And now I invite you to take a posture of prayer. This is the night 
that Christ the Lamb of God gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. This is the night that Christ gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the night that Christ took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, giving us an example that we should do to others as he has done to us. This is the night that Christ our God gave us this holy feast, that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may here proclaim his holy sacrifice and be partakers of his resurrection and at the last day may reign with him in heaven. Let us pray together the Collects for Purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. On these two commandments hang all the laws and prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us and write both your laws in our hearts. And now let us pray together the collect for Monday Thursday. God, our Father, you have invited us to share in the supper which your son gave to his church to proclaim his death until he comes again. May he nourish us by his presence and unite us in his love, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbour in obtaining one. 
the lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Verse 11. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to John, chapter 13, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, 
Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. So while reclining next to Jesus, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. So after receiving the piece of bread, Judas immediately went out and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. standing, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. Please be seated. My wife and I really don't buy gifts for each other. We don't practice it on birthdays, not much on Christmas. If there is something special, we'll ask each other if we actually want it. Not much of a surprise, though. And besides, in Asian families, cash is king as a gift. So what's the point of giving cash when you're already sharing bank accounts? But this raised the question between us, are gifts less meaningful if they are planned and scheduled? And if you've been in any sort of long-term relationship, you've probably encountered or you've heard of this five love languages. In fact, gift giving is one of those five love languages. One of the five primary ways in which we show love and we receive love. So it begs the question, is love, is love more or less authentic if it is maintained? It, if it is maintained by routine? If you have to work for it, plan for it, schedule it, is love or the demonstration of love any less powerful, any less genuine or less real? This evening on what the church calls Maundy Thursday, we are approaching Good Friday and Easter just beyond the horizon. In our scripture readings on this night of all nights, the last night before Jesus' death, are focused on a meal, a Passover meal, and then this strangely intimate act of bathing, a foot washing. These themes, like, 
very insignificant events with Jesus' crucifixion less than 24 hours away. The cross, the cross is the worldwide symbol of the Jesus movement. I don't see denominations having a foot on their pendant or a foot necklace. No one's doing that. So why these two acts tonight? First, we have this meal that Jesus shares, and then we have this act of washing dirty feet. Well, they show us how Jesus loves us. And then by showing how Jesus loves us, Jesus gives an example, a framework of how we are to love one another. So there isn't a special foot pendant, but tonight does have that special name of Maundy Thursday. Maundy comes, Maundy comes from that second last verse of our reading in verse 34 of the gospel. In Latin, mandatum novum, a new commandment. Jesus gives a new commandment in those last verses. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. So how does Jesus love us? Mandatum novum is where we're going to end up, but let's back up just to set the scene. As we heard Harpreet read for us from Exodus 12, this meal is the Passover meal, a special meal to commemorate and celebrate the time in Israel's history when God had delivered them from slavery, brought them out of Egypt. It is a perpetual ordinance, a day of remembrance, and it's an annual national holiday for all Jewish people, because humans, with our sieve-like memories, we need rituals and anniversaries to tell and retell the history of our lives and our people. And so for the nation of Israel, it's the equivalent of Thanksgiving, Diwali, Songkran, Independence Day, Cinco de Mayo, all wrapped into one. And it's during Passover that Jesus eats this last meal with his disciples, his closest followers who had been walking with them for the past three years, walking, eating, living together with Jesus. But this time, Jesus knows that this is the last Passover, that last meal, his last supper with those he loves. If you've been watching enough movies, you probably have seen the memes that are always in them where you have these last dying words that have extra impact. And Jesus has them too. He's not yet dying, but he has a message for them. Jesus knew that his time had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What does that mean exactly, to the end? To the end of time? To the end of his earthly existence? To his death, perhaps? Yes and yes. Jesus was returning to his Father in the eternity of heaven. And yes, Jesus loved them all the way to his death on the cross. But there's another meaning, perhaps, as well. It was to their end, to their completeness, to the end of each hair on the head of the disciples, to the end of the fingertips, to the end of each toe on the foot of every disciple. As a church, we often hear about God's eternal, unending love, and tomorrow we're going to spend some more time pondering Jesus' death on the cross. So for tonight, let's see how Jesus loves us to the end, loves us to the end of our physical bodies, and what that means for that mandatum novum that new commandment that Jesus gives. Foot washing is as ick and as squeamish as you can imagine. In ancient Near East of Palestine, uh, slaves, servants, they were given this menial task, the task of washing the dirty and dusty feet of their dinner guests, and it was probably reserved for the lowest rank, the youngest, the newest member of staff when guests arrived. But foot washing is also mundane. I'm sure that in the last 12 hours or in the next 12 hours, you will wash someone's feet, your own. Once you started bathing and washing yourself, which should be everyone here, only you know the ins and outs of your own feet. Not your doctor, not your mother, not even your spouse or your partner. You know which one looks like a chicken drumstick and which one points the wrong way. But this intimate act, this icky act, was intentionally a teaching moment from Jesus, their teacher, 
from Jesus, their Lord. And Jesus wasn't just washing their feet like any ordinary house servant would as an obligation, as a chore. No, this was still in the middle of supper. So instead of teaching them with words, Jesus often used signs, miracles, healing, feeding to teach his disciples. And so he's doing the same here now, teaching them in action. And so he uses this icky but mundane act to show them that he loved them completely to the ends of their toes. Jesus loved them to the end. Jesus loves us, you, me, to the end, down to the muddy parts of our lives, the intimate parts that no one else knows. For Jesus, foot washing is an expression of humility. This lowly act of a servant also points to Jesus' eventual humiliation on the cross. Humble, humility, humiliation, all from the same root word of humus. For the gardeners that know, humus, ground, soil. Jesus is on his hands and knees, and this is how he washes their feet. As Jesus washes their feet, he eventually comes to Peter, who rejects him. Peter won't allow Jesus to humiliate himself. In Peter's mind, teachers and lords, people of respect and authority, they don't stoop down. They don't stoop down figuratively, literally, for anything. And Peter thought that he was protecting Jesus, his closest friend. But in order for Jesus to have a share with them, to be a part of them, he must wash them. There's a lot more that we can say about washing and baptism. That's a separate topic being washed with water, being clean. If you've never been baptized and you are interested and you want to know what we're doing with baptism, please do come talk with us, our clergy team. We have a baptism coming up in June. But that's another topic. Eventually, Jesus does wash all their feet, all 10 toes of the 12 of them. We don't know if Peter's first in line or he's last in line, but after his dramatic outburst, his feet are now washed too. But we also know, if you're familiar with the story, that in a few more hours, Peter denies knowing Jesus. Jesus has already washed his feet. He knows this already. He knows this about Peter, and he washes his feet. He washes all their feet. He washes them from head to toe. So as Jesus finishes washing, they all return to eating, and that's when this next bombshell drops. Very truly, one of you will betray me. Spoiler alert, we know it's Judas. But everyone is confused. Who is it, Lord? I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine the scene for a minute. Your feet are still a bit damp from being washed. It's dim. There's only a bit of candlelight. There's the aroma of bread, fresh bread, pita or lafa bread, which is common in Palestine. There's a smell of other dishes. There's a smell of olive oil. Maybe it's tahini. And there's this low murmur. Who is it? Who is it? Who will betray Jesus? You can open your, you can open your eyes now. And as you've just been imagining that scenario, Jesus has just shown now another act of love. Now, love in action. Love to the end to all the disciples through that foot washing first. That love that is an action, this choice. But now Jesus has shown another kind of love. An embodied love to Judas. Jesus answered them, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And then Jesus gives the ultimate hospitality to Judas. Gives him that bread. Jesus loved Judas as well, just alongside all the other 12. And he showed that love with all his senses. These days, we're mostly used to being a, in the internet age of sight and sound. We primarily com communicate with words, with those senses of sight and hearing. And so we focus so much on those two, two senses, sight and hearing. But in this case, Jesus loved Judas to the end with all of his senses. 
there is touch. When his feet were washed, Judas could feel Jesus' hands pouring water, his hands holding his feet and his toes gently. There's this taste, there's this taste of fresh bread in his mouth, maybe dipped in some fresh olive oil. And there's smell, there's the smell of the bread, or maybe they're so close that Judas could have smelled Jesus, the scent of his clothes. Touch, taste, and smell, they are the more intimate senses. We can't touch, taste, or smell on the internet, not by email at least. We need to be in the same room. Love needs proximity, closeness. And that's how Judas left the meal, with his five senses all full of Jesus. The sight of Jesus, the sound of his voice, the touch of his hands washing his feet, the taste and smell of that last meal that he had with Jesus. And that's how Judas went out. And it was night. After receiving the piece of bread, Judas Judas immediately went out into the night, into the darkness, alone. Judas is always remembered as this betrayer, three years with Jesus, and now defined by this one action, the one who left everyone behind to do this wicked deed of betrayal. But later that night, we also know that Jesus goes out into the darkness to meet Judas once more again. Jesus, the light of the world, went into the darkness for Judas, and Jesus continues to venture into the darkness for you, for me. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Jesus goes into the darkness of our loneliness, into the nighttime of our souls, into the wickedness of our schemes and the plans for betrayal. Jesus goes into the darkness to search us out. Nothing you can do will betray Jesus' love for you. No one action defines us or separates us from Jesus' love because Jesus is the only person who could love you to the end of time, to the end of yourself, to the bitter end. Jesus goes out into that darkness to find you, to meet you, just as he did for Judas. We have this darkness of the world all around us, the darkness of our own hearts, which might overwhelm us, but it does not, it does not overwhelm the light of Jesus or the love of Jesus. So returning to my opening question, is love more or less authentic if it is maintained by routine? Love can be spontaneous, but it is much more than that. It actually might be more authentic and might be even deeper when we work for it, when we plan for it, when we maintain it. Those of you that have been married a long time will say that love is hard work. So as people learning to love and follow Jesus, we are commanded by this mandatum novum, this new commandment, to love each other with a love that is humble, grassroots, on hands and knees, on the floor. To love each other with a love that requires proximity, intimacy. We see and we remember that Jesus was born in human form to live among us. Proximity and intimacy, they are hard work. They require effort. Jesus commands us to love one another with a love that we can touch, that we can smell, that we can taste. An embodied love that needs physical bodies near each other. A love that goes into the darkness. Jesus showed that kind of love to Judas, his betrayer. Jesus showed that kind of love to Peter, his denier. And that is the kind of love that Jesus commands us. Who is Jesus commanding you to love? Is it someone who betrayed you? Someone who denied you. Or maybe Jesus is commanding you to love them to the end. With all your senses, with all their senses, closer, more intimately.
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God with your sight and your hearing, with your touch, taste, and smell. And love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Friends, we recognize that um, we all are different places in our spiritual journey. I invite you as you are able to join me as we proclaim and we affirm our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Do you believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ? I believe in one God, Jesus Christ, the only son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this holy night remembering the betrayal of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. We remember how Jesus entered Jerusalem and was celebrated as the King. We praise you for fulfilling the prophecies that pointed to your kingdom and for keeping your promises. We pray together, Lord, hear us and help us to always praise you. On this, the night he was betrayed, your son, Jesus Christ, washed his disciples' feet. We commit ourselves to follow his example of love for the other and service to all. We pray together, Lord, hear us and humble us. On this, the night Jesus was betrayed, he prayed for your will to be completed and not his. We release our own self-centered ambitions and desires, and commit to following your will for our lives. We pray together, Lord, hear us and renew our dedication to you. On this, the night Jesus was betrayed, he was abandoned by his disciples. We pray for all those who feel alone, rejected, and unloved. We commit to caring for all who are isolated in mind, body, or spirit. We pray together, Lord, hear us and fill us with your love. On this, the night Jesus was betrayed, he prayed for those given to him to love and redeem. We pray for the mission of your church. May we proclaim in word and deed that all people may hear and receive the message of your redeeming love and sacrifice. 
we pray together. Lord, hear us and renew our passion to bring people to you. On this, the night that he was betrayed, Jesus pointed his disciples and all who follow him to the future glory of a reconciled and renewed creation. We commit to the hope of trusting and obeying your word. We pray together. Lord, hear us, and we wait with eager anticipation of meeting you face to face. On this, the night he was betrayed, Jesus knew the trial and pain ahead of him. But still he prayed for us to take heart, because he has overcome the world, sin, and death. Father, we praise you for the peace you send to us in the highs and lows, in the good times and in suffering. We pray together, Lord, hear us and help us to always rely on you. And as we conclude these intercessions, let us pray together. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
You then who truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead the new life, following the commandments of God, walking from this day forward in God's holy ways, draw near with faith, take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all, we acknowledge and confess our many sins, which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from now on we may always serve and please you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who turn to him with heartfelt repentance and true faith, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen to our Lord Jesus Christ's words of assurance to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The apostle Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Apostle John also says, if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you thanks, Father most holy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For on this night he girded himself with a towel and taking the form of a servant, washed the feet of his disciples. He gave us a new commandment that we should love one another as he has loved us. Knowing that his hour had come, in his great love he gave this supper to his disciples to be an intention of his mission and passion, that he might proclaim his death until he comes again, and we rise with him in his kingdom. Therefore, he unites us with heaven, singing a new song of praise, and we too join with angels and archangels as we proclaim your glory without end.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there by his once and for all offering of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commands us to continue a perpetual memorial of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive this bread and wine according to your Son, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. On this very night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. Gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you shall do it. Drink it in remembrance of me. Except through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and as we eat and drink these holy gifts, grant by the power of your life-giving spirit, we may be made one in your holy church and partakers of the body and blood of your son, that he might dwell in us and we in him. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever, amen. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies, we're not even worthy to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord who delights in showing mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat this bread and to drink this wine, that our bodies and souls may be cleansed by Christ's precious body and blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Friends, there are gifts for everyone who has come this evening. Anyone baptized in any Christian tradition of any age is welcome to come forward and receive the bread and wine. 
If for any reason you don't wish to receive the bread and wine, we'd still love for you to come up with everybody else. Please cross your hands over your chest and it would be our privilege to pray a prayer of blessing for you this evening. You can come forward with the community up here to the high table, also to my left in the chapel, the Good Shepherd. And uh, when it's time, please join uh, the choir in singing the communion hymn and follow the directions of our friendly ushers.
Together, we pray using the words that Jesus gave his friends and disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you that in this wonderful sacrament, your son Jesus has given us a memorial of his passion. We thank you with all our hearts for feeding us with the spiritual food of his most precious body and blood, our Savior Jesus Christ. We acknowledge your love and care for us in making us members of Christ's mystical body, the blessed company of all faithful people and heirs of eternal life. And here we offer and present ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a holy and living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, return to the Lord your God. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Return to the Lord your God. From on high he sent fire and went deep into my bones. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all day. For these things I weep, my eyes flow with tears. For a comforter is far from me, one to revive my courage. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, return to the Lord your God. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at daughter Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? The thought of my affliction and homelessness is wormwood and gall. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, return to the Lord your God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, return to the Lord your God.
It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope, to give one's cheeks to, small, to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, return to the Lord your God. 